John Anna Clark, I'm the president of the Friends of the Library. We're so pleased to see all of you here today for this presentation. We do are very excited today to welcome one of our own. She's a member at large of the Friends of the Library Board. And she's a native of Dallas. She and her husband Rodney moved to Seguin in 1976 when she was hired to be the director of the mental health clinic. Almost two years later, they purchased both shoes, the Seguin downtown business that has been established, that had been established in 1957. For 38 years, they owned and operated that business until their retirement in 2015 when they sold it to a store employee. They raised their children, Jeremy and Carlin, in Seguin and now have two granddaughters, Sydney and Dora. This is Sydney is active in a variety of local community causes and activities, which includes the Friends of the Library. She's here today to share a very personal family story, and she hopes that others in our community will follow, follow suit at future events by sharing their own unique stories. Please help me welcome Sydney Burton. Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon. Family stories. We all have them. Some are passed down orally, some written or in photos. Today I'll be sharing stories from my family who, as Jews living in Nazi Germany, endured the horrors that we've all seen in books and in film. First-hand accounts of survivors are increasingly rare because so few are still alive. The voices that you'll hear today are from my German cousins in the form of letters to my great-grandmother and other relatives during the years 1838 to 1938 to 1941. First, a little bit of general history. German immigration to America was extensive during the 19th century. Seven and a half million Germans of different religions, Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, came between 1820 and 1870, attracted by land, ownership, economic opportunities, and religious freedom. Seguin and surrounding communities were definitely recipients of that German Im immigration. Here we see portraits of my great-great-grandparents, Moses and Caroline Ring. Caroline was born in Baltimore in 1836. Ten years older, Moses was born in Volkerschleier, Germany in 1826. Seen here, you can see uh, Volkerschleier on the map. It's in the northwest corner of Bavaria, 60 miles east of Frankfurt. The small village had a thriving Jewish community for centuries. With 59 Jewish residents in the year 1699, growing to 105 Jews in 1847. But many left for the US in the German wave of immigration that I mentioned. And by 1933, only 33 Jews remained. By 1937, with the growth of National Socialism, it decreased to 24. The day following Kristallnacht on November 9, 1938, stormtroopers carried out Goebbels' pogrom orders in Volkerschleier, destroying homes and the synagogue. Most Jews left after this devastation, but six remained, and two were my relatives. My great-great-grandfather, Moses Ring, was the eldest of five children. Uh, hopefully you have a handout there. This is the handout you have. Uh, it's part of my family tree, just the part that we're talking about today. I have a huge family tree, but this zeroes in on, on these families. Uh, Moses' line is on the far left-hand side. See up here, Moses and Caroline. Those were the ones in the portraits. They, oh, back to the mic. In 1842, at the young age of only 16, Moses decided to leave Germany for America, the land of opportunity. His sister Clara, four years younger at age 12, was so distraught about his plans uh, to leave that their parents, Mordecai and Rachel, on top of the tree, agreed that she could go with them. So the two children traveled alone to Baltimore from Germany, having heard from other Jews who had recently immigrated that it was a favorable place. 
In 1826, 16 years before their immigration, Maryland, the Maryland legislature had passed a special Jew bill, is what it was called, which gave Jews in Maryland all rights and privileges that were extended to Christians, hence their optimism for opportunities there. Moses borrowed money to buy a pack and peddled his wares across Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. This is his peddler's cane from 1842. He was very ambitious, and in three short years, he established a manufacturing plant to supply menswear to other peddlers. He worked 12 to 14 hour days, dealt honestly and fairly with everyone, prospered, and gave back to his community. Moses and Caroline married in Baltimore in 1851. He was 25, she was 15. They had 12 children, with my great-grandfather Marcus being number seven. And if you'll look at your handout, Marcus is right there in the middle of the 12 children that Moses and Caroline had. On the left-hand side, you see my great-grandfather Marcus, his wife, my great-grandmother Fanny, along with my uh, grandmother Carlin, who my daughter is named after, and her sister Ruth. Neither Marcus nor any of his 11 siblings were educated beyond the ages of 14 to 16 because they went into the family business, or in the case of females, they got married. Marcus died in Baltimore pre-World War II in 1934 at age 71. But Fanny, his wife, my great-grandmother, uh, she was 14 years his junior, and she lived to the age of 95. And she was a widow for 38 years. I was 22 when she passed away, and I cherish our very special relationship. So it's Fanny. I called her Mimi, and I'm going to refer to her as Mimi. My Aunt Ruth and other Baltimore relatives who are at the American core of my story today. On the right is a later photo of Mimi and Aunt Ruth around 1940, around the time of these letters. Mimi was about 63 here, and Ruth was in her mid-30s. The two of them worked tirelessly for several years on behalf of German cousins of husband and father Marcus. Cousins whose ancestors, had, ancestors who had never immigrated from Germany like his father did, 16-year-old Moses and 12-year-old Clara, they did that in 1842, and who found themselves in a most dire situation from 1938 and into the 1940s. So enough of the family lineage and on to the letters. How did we get possession of these letters? So my mother was in, often in communication with a distant cousin, Claire, a descendant of the 12-year-old Clara, who I mentioned accompanied her brother Moses to America in 1842. Mother and Claire were both great-granddaughters of Moses and Caroline, the ones in the portraits. They kept in touch, discussing family history via phone and letters, pre-email and text. And in 1999, she sent Mother a treasure in the form of these family letters. We've all heard people discovering precious items found in attics and basements when descendants are cleaning out the home of a deceased relative. Thank you. A different descendant of Mordecai and Rachel's children had found a packet of letters and documents in her mother's basement and mentioned them to Cousin Claire, saying she didn't think they were too important because they weren't of any relation of hers. Thankfully, Claire knew the family history and told her they were her own relatives, asked for copies, and shared them with my mother. So before I start reading from the letters, I need to explain the steps that Mimi took to sponsor the cousins. She first had to submit an affidavit of support to the U.S. government for each of the families. Here we see one of them. These act as a contract between Mimi and the U.S. that she would guarantee financial support for 40 quarters 
or 10 years or until they became citizens. She was also required to put a substantial amount of money in bank accounts set aside for their support. Here we have proof of her doing this in two, with two Baltimore banks. We all remember taking these savings books, right, into the bank's pre-computer. Then the families themselves had to apply for visas with a U.S. consulate inside of Germany. Once valid sponsorship was accepted by the U.S. State Department, the cousins had to wait for their visa numbers to come up. Most often after 1938, they were told it would be a one and a half to two year wait. And by then the affidavit process had to begin all over again because they were expired after one year. An unfortunate catch-22. Tickets via steamship liners also had to be obtained. So the discoverer of the documents in the, basis, in the basement was Elsa Ring. Born in 18, uh, 1932, she had been a six-year-old child of one of the families who were successfully sponsored by Mimi. They actually got out of Germany in early, mid-1938, along with two other families. And here we see her father, where that arrow is, that's her father. In 1926, uh, there was some kind of community and family gathering in Volkerschleier. And uh, so when uh, other German cousins heard of Leo's successful immigration, they too reached out to Mimi for help. There were at least four more families of parents and children who were in constant written com communication with her, my Aunt Ruth and other Baltimore relatives, begging and pleading their cause. I'll now be sharing their story and read excerpts from their letters. These are excerpts. These excerpts are but a fraction of the many and lengthy letters sent across the Atlantic. All of them are descendants of Abraham Ring, one of Moses' four siblings. So. Here, I'll try to talk loudly. Here are, here is Abraham, is the brother to Moses, and these, this, and this, all these people are the ones that were asking for help to get out. This line, she did get out. So there's Leo, I just showed you his picture, his wife, Liesl, and Elsa, who uh, found the letters in the basement, in her mother's basement. So uh, we're going to talk about Herman Goldschmidt, Adolf Goldschmidt, Abraham Goldschmidt, and Rachel Goldschmidt Bergman. The first uh, family is Herman Goldschmidt. Born in 1878, his mother Caroline was first cousin to my great-grandfather Marcus. The le his letters uh, begin late summer 1938. And the first one is an excerpt from a letter of introduction from a rabbi in Fulda, Germany, to Rabbi Rosenauer, a Baltimore cousin. Dear Rabbi, I am gladly writing a few lines of recommendation for the Herman Goldschmidt family who I have known for many years. They are modest, diligent, and good people who always enthusiastically tackle any task. Circumstances have dictated they are no longer able to earn necessities for their subsistence. Your kindness would be greatly appreciated if you, very honored Rabbi, could help them toward a new existence in America. You can be assured that your charitable works will benefit worthy and religious people who are very well regarded and have reared their children likewise in this manner. Two weeks later, uh, Herman writes to Mimi regarding an affidavit of support. Dear Cousin Fanny, you are no doubt aware that here in Germany, life and earning possibilities have greatly lessened, such that we are forced with a view to the future of our children to seek a new existence in the U.S. Since immigration is not possible without securities, I would like to ask you to provide me with an affidavit. I'm the oldest son of your cousin Caroline, 59 years old. My wife is 49. My three children, two sons and a daughter, are grown. Until three years ago, I was able to manage my livestock trade store. 
My eldest son, a trained merchant, is diligent, hardworking, and strong, and has been without work for a while. Second son, 19, has been working in my store and is likewise a very useful young man, not afraid of any work. My daughter, 15, has been employed in a foreign household to the fullest pleasure of her employers. You need not fear that we will be a burden on you because all of us will do any work and God willing will stay healthy. Because you, dear cousin, are the only relative to whom I can turn for help, I sincerely hope you, since you have helped other relatives to immigrate, you will not refuse me this help. October 13th, 38, there's a letter of a from a friend of Herman's to Mimi. Here's an excerpt. Dear Mrs. Ring, I have been here in America for 14 days. At the time of my departure, I was urgently asked by your relative Herman to write you regarding the security for his family. He knows no other possibility to get away and the people there are in a desperate situation. I don't need to paint the picture to you of the situation for Jews in Germany. November 15, 38, Herman to Mimi. If you cannot instantly affect affidavits for the whole family, at least for sons Walter and Arthur, don't think that they or we may become a burden to you as we are hardworking, modest, and industrious people. Please fulfill our instant request. You oblige us for the rest of our lives. Your help is very urgent. Please be assured of everlasting thankfulness. Two months later, January 12th, Herman to Mimi. Very dear cousin, we received your kind letter of December 25th. Accept our very best thanks because you give us hope for help, which you are long, we are longing for so instantly. We really des are desperate on account of our present situation. Only immediate affidavit for entering the States can help us from facing very serious new experiences. Therefore, please do what you can. Urge the matter as much as possible to get affidavits for us, as we have to leave the country very soon. We have to go to another country for a so-called transit stay until it is our turn for getting visas. And then he gives her lots of instructions. March 20th, two months later, Herman to Mimi. I'm very glad to inform you we got the affidavits for all of us. We have, been waiting, we have waiting numbers of about two years but we are compelled to leave here before that time will have elapsed, so we must look for another country to stay. Bolivia insists upon paying of landing money to be deposited with a reliable bank and then transferred to Bolivia. Another letter. With great joy today, I received from the U.S. Consulate in Stuttgart the news that your securities had arrived. Please accept thanks from my heart. I sincerely regret they do not recognize recognize the securities by themselves is sufficient. Additional documents are f required. Heartfelt, I ask you to take care of these and send them as soon as you can. Be assured it's very painful for me to have to ask you again and again. No other means is available in this desperate, desperate situation. I will make good on all your expenditures when I'm over there and earning money. I will never forget the selfless way you have been helpful to me. I hope you and the dear others are in the best of health. Thank God I can report the same to you. Then there's a long lag of time of correspondence. I'm sure there were letters, but I don't have them. Herman to Mimi, uh, January 41. Today I must turn to you once again. Our immigration time is nearing, and we will soon be called to receive our visas. However, I would like to ask you to procure for us a new security because the old one is invalid. Time has expired. Time is running out, and I beg you earnestly to do this. January 30th, there's a letter from the Advisory Board for Jews in Germany regarding the expired securities. Then they request a letter of credit or a trust fund with monthly withdrawals so the U.S. consulate will recognize it. Then there's a letter from a 19-year-old uh, ne nephew who had previously immigrated to the United States. I have heard from my parents, who are unfortunately still in Germany, that both of Herman's sons are in prison or in a concentration camp. And that's the end of Herman's correspondence. The next set of letters are from Adolf Goldschmidt, you can see on the family tree. Born in 1890, he and Herman were brothers. Here's Herman, his wife, Susie, and their children, 16-year-old Bertie and 15-year-old Martin. September 1st, 38, Adolf to Mimi. Dear relative, I beg to introduce myself as a near relative and I request you recognize me in this way, although till now we have not known each other. I'm the youngest son of Caroline Goldschmidt from Fulda, born a ring from Volkerschleier. 
I'm well informed that you have already given help to some relatives, but nevertheless, I beg you to have an understanding for my desperate situation too, and consider how to help to give an affidavit for me and my family. You must not be afraid to run any risk in doing so that I shall in no way burden you. My wife and myself are both healthy and strong. We've always been used to hard work. Having at the beginning of my career trained as a butcher, I will surely be able to find work in this profession or in any business. My wife is fit in any housework, cooking, pie making, etc., and will be able to earn this way. My daughter of 16 is already working in a household and she perfectly satisfies her employers. My son, 15, is training as a locksmith. Superfluous to mention, we are all learning English diligently. Until now, we have lived in good circumstances, but now at the end of this month, I must give up my trade by the new rules and shall be unemployed here, unable to earn anything. So immigration becomes most urgent, awaiting your favorable answer. Three months later, January 39, Adolf to Mimi, I have received the affidavit from you. I do not have enough words to express my thanks for your unselfishness. With this, you have done me a great service, and I wish I had the opportunity to show you my gratitude in person. If my immigration doesn't take place for one to two years, I can at least, according to the affidavit, spend time in a temporary place. Four months later, May 16, 39, Adolf to Mimi, my dear cousin, the reason of my writing today is to beg you with all my heart to support our immigration as soon as possible. Owing to the very high quota number, immigration is in two years. It is impossible to stay that long. Friends told me that with the help of a foreigner, it could be possible to enter Cuba and wait till our time comes. And then he asked her to send money to the Joint Relief Committee in Havana. December 39. Once more, I thank you very best for the affidavit, which I did not give away yet. Now, after a long wait, it is finally my turn. Next month, the consulate at Stuttgart summons me my affidavit to send, but the document is not any more lawful, and therefore I beg you to renew it again and the necessary documents. I know I cause you much labor and expense, and I promise you I am grateful. The consulate wants new documents with new dates. They require a declaration that our maintenance will be secure. January 8, 39. After a very long wait, I was summoned by the American consulate to send my documents that they be proved. However, they must be dated after March 31st, 39. Unfortunately, I don't have it yet, referring to the new one. April 40. Actually, that last letter was 40, I'm sorry. Uh, yesterday, I received the affidavit. You surely imagine how happy we are and we are only talking about our near immigration and the kindness of you and your brother in helping us so generously. Perhaps there will be a possibility of showing you our gratitude. Our waiting number is 17,041. It's now, it's now reached and I hope that the American consulate orders us soon. May of 1940, Adolf Tamimi. I just received a letter from the consulate that besides the affidavits, they they still need a certified declaration of the guarantor that secures our subsistence for an uncertain time. The form for that is the opening of a bank account in my name with a sum of about $5,000. November 20th, 1940, Adolf Tamimi. I beg you to cause your brother to send a certified declaration that he obliges, obliges himself for us in the U.S. for living, boarding, and a weekly sum for personal necessaries. Please send this to the American consulate at Stuttgart. Without this obligation, the affidavit will not be acknowledged. I accept strictly that never shall I claim anyhow. Perhaps you can help that we can immigrate through Cuba, Santo Domingo, or the Antilles. January 41. Mimi's brother sent the, all the uh, declaration requested by Adolf to the American consulate, and he writes, I'm writing in reference to an affidavit of support which I furnished in December of 38 and April 4th of 1940, and he outlines all the living accommodations, indefinite monetary support, and employment opportunities. This statement, which carries my sworn signature, is a guarantee and a definite insurance that the Goldschmidt family will at no time become public charges if admitted into the U.S. April 2nd, 41, Adolf Domimi. Thank you so much for your letter dated January 21st. With that, we had a big delight. The consulate informs us with a letter of March 26 that the affidavits are sufficient. We are happy and thank you very best for your help, noblesse, and generosity. We shall never regret, forget. 
Then he asked about passages, uh, tickets to be secured. August 3rd, 1941, so several months later, he asked Mimi if the consulate certificate was received. Be so kind as to obtain for, for us from the State Department Immigration Division in Washington an immigration consent based on the application of the certificate. Please take steps immediately so we may receive the visa. The matter has to be accomplished by you. A month later, September 41, Mimi replied to Adolf's last letter. I received your letter dated August 3rd and glad to hear from you. I would have answered sooner, but waited till I could get def definite information. It is impossible to get a visa to the US and also to Cuba. Have been trying to do so for Regina and Frida Bergman and the Bambergers without results, other families. My daughter Ruth went to Washington to the State Department and also to the Consul General there, and they told her immigration at present is not possible. Therefore, it would not help for me to send the papers now, as later you would need them, uh, they would have to be renewed. I sincerely regret I can do nothing more now. That's the end of Adolf's letters, and they, of course, perished. The next set of letters are Abraham Goldschmidt. Born in 1891, his mother Teresa was also a first cousin to my great-grandfather Marcus. In the fall of 38, Mimi received letters requesting help from his wife, Ida. Abraham had already been imprisoned in a camp, so that was early in 38. I will first read a letter from Ida's brother, who was living in Milan, Italy at the time. January 1st, 1939, from Abraham's brother-in-law to Mimi. I am taking up the cause of my sister's family. I want to share with you that there is a great tragedy in the family. Abraham has been in prison since November in a camp. The family has six children. The last one is only five weeks old, and the father has not seen it yet. My sister and his mother write me one hopeless letter after another. I cannot help from here because in Italy, we also have been expelled and have to leave the country in a few weeks. I have written to the committee in England so that a few children can be taken care of there, so God willing, that will be accomplished. Abraham and his family are registered with the US, but they are still missing a security. If it were available, perhaps he could be released from the prison and perhaps there's a possibility to go to Holland or some other European country where he could wait until summoned by the American consulate. Because the need is so great for the family with him in prison and she recovering from childbirth with six children, I would like to request the following, and he details what's needed. Again, please help if there's any way possible, and above all, I ask to help quickly before it's too late. The same day, Ida writes uh, Rabbi Rosenauer in Baltimore, a Baltimore cousin. Your dear relative, Fanny Ring, said your dear wife is the chairwoman of your local committee and can see to it that two of our children can come over to you. They must be requested by you from the Aid Society of the German Children in Berlin. Fanny writes that they can be well accommodated. I'm enclosing two passport pictures of the children. These are, oh, wait, what happened? These are the passport pictures of the children, two of her six children, one of which is five weeks old, or was. Um, January 1st, 39. Oh, then March of 39, there's another letter from Ida uh, about trying to get out to Bolivia, and then there's no more communication from that family. The last story is uh, about Regina and Moritz Bergman. Regina was born in 1895 and was a sister to Abraham Goldschmidt, the one who was, I just mentioned was already interred in a camp. So her mother, Teresa, was also first cousin to my great-grandfather, Marcus. The Bergman family experienced unusual circumstances. Regina's husband, Moritz, had been imprisoned in Dachau in early 1938. And somehow he was released or fled, I don't know how, but a few months later he was out of Dachau. He returned home but immediately vanished by foot through the forest, took a train and a steamship to England where he lived in various refugee camps there until his immigration to the US in 1941. 
During his internment in England, he and his wife Regina, who's the cousin from Germany, were in constant communication with Mimi, planning and trying to make arrangements for Regina and daughter Friedel's passage to America and a reunion for them in America. I'll read now excerpts from their letters. So here is Moritz, who's the one who's in the refugee camps in, uh, who escaped, Dachau. And then uh, on the right-hand side is uh, Frida, Friedel, here it says Frida. Uh, she often took a neighbor's baby out in the pram. So the first letter that I have is July 7th, 1938. There must have been previous ongoing communication because Regina writes to Mimi, my dear cousin Fanny, today we received the affidavit and send you above all much hearty gratitude. We send it at once to the American consulate. I hope we shall be summoned soon. August 15th, 38, she writes to Mimi. We received today a letter from the consulate. I am very sorry to trouble you again, and I'm grateful. They are requiring information for the sponsor that is certified and verified. Please answer as soon as possible. Exact relation to alien, reason for desiring support, monetary obligation intended for support, names of previously sponsored aliens, sponsor's age, financial plan for indefinite time. Dear cousin, all of these declarations are fixed formalities. We shall never intend to make use of your obligations. A week later, Mimi sends the requested information to the U.S. consulate in Stuttgart. In the letter to the consulate, she explains her relationship and reasons for wanting to sponsor the Bergman family. She guarantees $100 a month, exclusive of rent indefinitely, explains, explains her sponsorship of other family members who are arriving in America soon. She reports that she and other Baltimore relatives have deposited in two different banks a sum of $4,860 plus interest for seven persons, and once the sum is exhausted, more would be forthcoming. She mentions she's already sent a notarized letter from both banks certifying the funds. September 11, 38, from Regina to Mimi. I am so sorry we have so much trouble. You will have heard that in the meantime a new law was coming from the American government. Therefore it will be impossible to come with cousin Leo and his family to America. They can tell you all. With best wishes for Rosh Hashanah and many regards. One year later, November of 39, from the U.S. State Department to Regina, you are hereby informed the submitted material is outdated. Since your husband is now in England, you should ask that your guarantors to issue separate documents for you and your daughter. Mimi had already sent them, but Regina didn't know that. These documents must attest that the guarantors know that you and your daughter want to immigrate without your husband and that they are ready to take care of your subsistence so that you don't become a burden to the American state. Additionally, your husband should attest to the consulate that he is in agreement with your immigration without him. December of 39 from Moritz, who's still in England, to Mimi. Regina and I thank you anew for your kindness. I know perfectly what a lot of trouble you have because of us. It's very painful. At first, the American Department of our camp here agreed about sending documents via Holland, then they changed their mind and ordered it to be sent to Stuttgart. That's why I gave you different directions, and it's all right, they've already been sent to Holland. Concerning the steamship tickets for Frida, uh, Regina and Friedel, I ask you buy them from an Italian line only, as it is much more, uh, less dangerous than via Holland. Don't write to the Stuttgart consulate, it, it would be a great disadvantage to them. And then there's more instructions about the tickets. Here's a, a letter from the Italian line, the American office in Pennsylvania, uh, from the Baltimore travel agent that Mimi used. And a check for 468 was sent for securing two tickets from Genoa, Italy to New York. December 16th, a letter from the Italian line back to the travel agent. We have today issued the prefade tickets and are arranging to forward it to our home office in Genoa. We will do all possible to rush delivery of the tickets to the passengers, but as advised during our telephone conversation, our suggestion would be to cable in view of existing circumstances. December of 39, letter from Mimi to the London American Consulate regarding Moritz's immigration. In the letter, she explains she has opened bank accounts with sufficient funds for support and closes 
photostatic copies. She gives the details about the cousins she had sponsored one year previously and who were already working and financially independent. January 40 from Moritz in Kent, in England, to Mimi and Ruth. Thank you ever so much for the affidavits of support which I got on January 7th. I hope to be summoned very soon to fetch the visa. Dear Regina wrote me two very excited letters within eight days. You might be sure it's very disagreeable for me to be compelled to cause you so much trouble, but Regina is writing such desperate letters. She asked me to inform you that you must not write anything about the tickets to the consul since they interrogate all persons getting their visas, whether they pay themselves for the passage, and it is necessary to say yes. The consul does not like if people are not in a position to pay for their passage. He goes on about buying tickets for package, not knowing that Mimi had already done it. Uh, the main thing is to have a ship starting from Italy to America is quite more safe than another one as the danger of mines is not so great. Please note all expenses you have on our behalf are in order that we are in a position to pay back even in installments in a few years. I'm very anxious on account of the desperate letters of dear Regina. My best love to all relatives. Then there are many, many letters back and forth between the Italian line and Mimi and the travel agent regarding the tickets. March 30, 13, 1940, from Moritz to Mimi, our hope to come soon to you is nearly destroyed. The consulate in Stuttgart formally wrote us that we have been registered in August, whereas the actual consulate wrote us the date was September 38. This is a mistake, and I believe it must be a confusion in the consul's office. Regina wrote that she cannot convince them of their mistake. He insists upon the registration being made in September. My immigration from here in England is dependent on the Stuttgart consulate, and thus I cannot move. I do not care for myself, but on behalf of my dear wife and child, especially when they should be compelled to stay in Germany for another half or three-quarter year. The last letter from her was very exciting and unhappy. She is compelled to live in a country where they are always under danger for their lives. I am very ha unhappy about these conditions as a lot of people have been moved compulsory to Lublin, which is in Poland. We are all fearing they could be sent there. It is terrible to be informed by the wireless of the suffering. I see no hope. Therefore, I beg to ask whether you could give me advice. I have been told of neutral countries where immigrants to the U.S. could stay until they are allowed to go to the U.S., Portugal or Italy. Please apologize that I am causing such troubles, but except the Lord in you, we have no one in the world who can help us. March 1940, from Moritz to Mimi. I received another letter from dear Regina, the contents of which have me excited and really smashed. They are in danger of life and highest distress. I've been told in New York there's a travel office which is in a position to ask, act as an agent for people who have a long wait time, whom they could bring to this time for this time in a neutral country. I ask you to inquire if this is true. There are possibilities in Santo Domingo and Haiti. And he gives all the information to Mimi. I repeat a proposal in my last letter. This was about working as a farmer in the US and deducting wages and installments to repay her. I will work so much that the blood will run from my fingers. April 2nd, 1940 to Mimi. Here we see two letters, uh, communication between the Dominican Republican, Republic and the Mexican em Embassy with Mimi. From the Dominican Republic Settlement Association in New York to Mimi, they write that hopefully they will be able to have a solution for the, in the next couple of weeks, and they ask if financial guarantees can be made. And from the American Embassy in Washington to Mimi, all foreigners are request, required to post a cash bond in the immigration office at the Mexican port of entry. Said bonds amount to 750 Mexican currency per person for Europeans. And then they advise her to go to the ne nearest uh, Mexican consulate in Germany. May, May of 40 from Dominican Republic Settlement Association. In the letter they ask what Regina's quota number is and explain their current program is designed as an agri agricultural settlement for young people with prior training in farming. They hope to formulate another plan for temporary asylum for other rep refugees whereby financial guarantees would be required. And then uh, two weeks later they write, we are sorry we are unable to meet the re present requirements of, you are unable to meet the present requirements of the Dominican Republic. 
May of 40 from Moritz to Mimi. I've been told there would be a possibility for them to get permission to immigrate to Cuba under the condition that a person who lives there guarantees livelihood until their re-emigration to the U.S. Perhaps you have a friend in Cuba who can arrange it. June 40 from Moritz to Mimi. He's now in a camp uh, in the Isle of Man. He reiterates the Cuba plan. September, he hears very little from his family and he hopes to get his own visa number the next month. October 40, I'm happy informing you I have my visa, am awaiting my permit and hope to be able to sail the middle of November. Kindly inform Regina and the American consulate my visa number is 8731. Perhaps they will be kind enough to issue the visas for Regina and Friedel. I have no news for them since the 3rd of June, so that's like four months. Please write and ask to say if they are all right. October of 40 from Mimi to Regina. She writes as requested regarding the visa and the consulate and she ends by saying, it is our constant prayer that we may soon have you all together with us and Leo's family. Let us hear from you as soon as you can. August of 41 from Regina to Mimi. Moritz is now in Baltimore. I'm very happy that dear Moritz is with you. It's our wish to be reunited with him again, and hopefully that will be soon, thanks to your kind assistance. I hear from him often, and I look to hearing from good things from you. Right hearty greetings to all. August 31st, 41, to Mimi. We are very grateful for your willingness to provide an entry to Cuba for us, but unfortunately, it was again too late because the Cuban consulate is now closed. I was so looking forward to the reunion with dear Moritz and getting to know you all. Now we have to trust in the dear Lord again. I offer you my sincerest wishes for the new year, Rosh Hashanah, 1941. September 4th, 41, from Mimi to the State Department in Washington. She had been to the Washington State Department the month before asking about the Cuban consulates, but those, I said, was, were closed. She says in her letter to the State Department, we have heard that negotiations are underway whereby an American visa for immigration to the U.S. may be attained through an American embassy in Berlin, which was still functioning, the, the embassy. She explains they have all their papers, but the consulates have been closed. She te also tells them that the husband father is here in the U.S. and has applied for citizenship. Two weeks later, September 22nd, 1941. Here is a final letter from the U.S. State Department in Washington, D.C. to Mimi, responding to her letter earlier in the month. The Department of State is, of course, deeply sympathetic with the plight of persons in this situation and with the distress of their relatives in the U.S. Unfortunately, it is impossible to consider the visa applications of persons residing in Germany since all consular officers have been withdrawn at the request of the German government. And as much as the Immigration Act of 1924 expressly limits authority to issue immigration visas to consular officers, the dip diplomatic officers at the American Embassy in Berlin are not empowered to consider these applications. In the event the aliens are able to proceed to a territory which they may appear at American consulate, you should notify us immediately in order that appropriate advice may be given. Before taking action, the department should be furnished with definite evidence that the aliens will be able to obtain permission to leave the country in which they are now residing and to enter some other country where the visa application will be executed. Otherwise, it is believed there is that any useful purpose, no useful purpose will be served by further correspondence in this manner. So this letter from the State Department closes the door on all further efforts to help Regina or any other family member. Moritz, her husband, experienced tremendous survivor's guilt. He never forgave himself that he left his family in 1938 under the mistaken hope that he could arrange for them to leave Germany. He became a U.S. citizen, lived in Baltimore until 1955 when he immigrated to Israel and then later died there. Before I close, I'd like to show you another cane. that belonged to my great-great-grandfather Moses, the one that immigrated here in 1842. An engraved gold tip ca cane that was presented to him for service to his community in the year 1867, just 25 years after his arrival at age 16. A stark contrast to his original peddler's cane. 
As an immigrant to the U.S., he found opportunities here and worked hard for his success. Unfortunately, many of his nieces and nephews caught in dire circumstances in Germany almost 100 years after his immigration were murdered along with millions of others. World events like these and the stories they pr produce have occurred for many centuries and continue to be repeated in countries around the world year after year, as we are now unfortunately seeing in Ukraine. We here are so very fortunate to live in America where we have freedoms and laws that protect us from tyranny and hatred. It's crucial that we continue and cherish this legacy. All of our family histories are important because we, without them we lose generations of stories and all the benefits that come from, with them. As historian Robin Fivish wrote, because our families are among the most important social groups we belong to and identify with, Stories about our family tell us who we are in the world and who we should be. Stories about our parents and our grandparents provide models of both good times and bad times, as well as models of overcoming challenges and sticking together. I thank you all for coming today to listen to the readings of the Cries for Help. I'd also like to give thanks to two very special people who serve on the Friends of the Library Board. First, many of the letters had already been translated from German to English, but some had not. And uh, Anne Louise Haggerty, Anne Louise, are you here? Oh, there she is. Raise your hand again. <laughs> okay. She uh, was a former German teacher. She serves on the Friend of the Library Board and was the former uh, president. Uh, she diligently worked at translations, particularly difficult when some were handwritten. I think I showed you one of those. Uh, and secondly, retired TLU librarian Martha Wren, over here, developed the PowerPoint presentation and re researched the history of Volkerschleier for me. I couldn't have accomplished this presentation without their help, and I thank you both from the bottom of my heart. Lastly, I want to give a shout out to our wonderful library here. Sylvia Christie, Erica, who does, Sylvia is the assistant director, and uh, Erica is the social media person, and uh, they were very, very helpful. Couldn't do it without them either. And I'm sure you all agree that we have a real treasure here at the library in the form of books, buildings, and people. Mm -hmm.